Good evening. All right. So again, show of hands, uh, raise your hand if this is your first time coming to one of these events. Awesome. All right. Same here. Um, <laughs> another question, raise your hand if you've never seen a term sheet before. All right, awesome. So we're going to take care of both of those tonight. But uh, my name is Terry Rice, and I'm a business consultant based here in New York City, working with a lot of startups. Uh, and then beyond that, I'm also the digital marketing expert in residence at Entrepreneur Magazine, where I'm also a contributor. And it's funny because normally uh, in these situations, I'm helping startups position themselves better to get terms or get funding um, from a potential investor. And it, I was actually um, participating as a judge in a pitch competition recently which was unique for me because, again, I'm normally prepping people. And this person didn't win, unfortunately, um, that I was talking to. And the judges said the reason why he didn't win is because he didn't um, have a patent on his product. So I talked to him afterwards. I said, hey, man, you know, you would have won if you had a patent. And he's like, I did. I'm like, oh, you should have mentioned that. <laughs> so, so that's when I realized in that moment how important, how important attention to detail is which is why I'm so glad we're talking about these term sheets tonight, right? Because those little tiny details that you might miss can really make or break a company. And uh, fortunately, we have a great panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, we're going to share their experience with us. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with that now. Sure. Hi, I'm Salil Gandhi. I'm a technology partner at uh, the law firm of Goodwin uh, Proctor. We uh, specialize in helping startups uh, throughout their life cycle. So we work with startups as early as formation, all the way through exit on a private basis or in the public market. So. Really excited to be here and, and talk to you about kind of one of the first really important steps in, in your company. My name is Maria Valaceris. I'm a serial entrepreneur and angel investor. I'm a member of Pipeline Angels and we invest in early stage female founded companies. Hi, and I'm Ricardo McKenzie. I'm with JP Morgan. I'm in the investment bank and I advise uh, founders, entrepreneurs on raising private capital, connecting them with the right uh, pools of capital and negotiating those transactions. Happy to be here. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Stramberg. I'm on the investment team at Lair Hippo. Um, we're the most active seed fund based here in New York. We do both consumer and enterprise. Uh, so Caitlin, I'm actually gonna go ahead and come right back to you. Uh, for those people that are completely new to fundraising, can you just explain what a fundraising term sheet is and what key elements it covers? Yes. So, um, so at the very most basic level, a term sheet is a non-binding um, contract. It's a document um, that has a handful of terms that basically outlines what will happen um, in an investment. And so usually it's the piece of paper, two pieces of paper, or in some instances, 10 pieces of paper that you'll use to define the parameters of an investment and a parameter of a deal. And then um, that's what the lawyers will take and turn into hundreds of pages of legal doc. Um, so that's kind of like the most tactical, what is a term sheet? I think um, it's really important to take a step back and, and think about like why term sheets exist. So, um, so as a venture capital investor, um, we get money from people we call limited partners, and they basically trust us with their capital to deploy and steward, hoping that there will be a return on their investment. And so when they give us capital, um, we agree to a handful of commitments and obligations that we will um, pay attention to where that capital goes. Um, we'll put kind of restrictions, rights, and protections in place so we can protect that investment um, throughout the life cycle of a company. And so, so really a term sheet is um, a list of rights and protections that investors have. It really comes into play when things go poorly. Um, and when things go well, usually the terms don't really matter. We don't really talk too much about the terms. It's, uh, it's a set of kind of rules and obligations for when things go poorly. Um, I think one thing that's important to think about with the term sheet is um, it's really an opportunity for the investor and the founder to be in line over um, certain elements. It's so we're kind of continuing to have the same incentives to row the boat in the, direction, the same direction, which is to build a very powerful and successful and massive business. Um, so there are all sorts of terms in there that, that um, that accomplish that, I think um, you know, there are a number of good terms. So on one hand, a term would be um, assembling a board. So you have a right to a board. Investors have rights to information. Um, we have equity carved out for employees. These are all really good things. Um, kind of on the negative side, as a protection for investors, there are things like um, voting rights, which mean as a founder, you can't sell parts of the business without approval or um, you can't do things that would harm the company. 
Um, so it's a little bit of a mix of both, and I think we'll go into the details. At the very high level, though, I think the things that people care about the most are, you know, how much are you raising? That goes into the term sheet. What's the valuation of the company? Um, things like what is the option pool, and we'll go into detail about what an option pool is. How do you incentivize employees? What does the board structure look like? What does voting look like? Um, there's a great little clause at the end which says once you sign this term sheet, you can't shop it to other people. There are all sorts of things, and, and, um, and we'll go into great detail. Um, but typically, at the highest level, a term sheet outlines who controls the company and when, and then what the valuation of the company is. Yeah, and I think what I'd add to that is I kind of think about those set of terms in a couple different buckets. So you have financing terms or what you're selling. Those are kind of the valuation terms. You have governance terms. You mentioned the board, protective provisions. Uh, and then you have kind of rights that the investors have. Uh, and they go beyond just kind of voting rights, but, but making sure that the company, for example, uh, has a similar vesting schedule for all, for all employees, that they're getting proper IP grants from all employees. So there's a whole, there's a whole of operational issues that the, that the investors are kind of thinking about in those three buckets. So, so financing, governance, and then investor rights. Yeah, thank you for that. So, so clearly there's going to be a lot of tough conversations that go into this document uh, that you want to be prepared for. Uh, but Maria, on your end, uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts because you're both an angel um, and an entrepreneur, right? So w for, for the angel perspective, is there a difference in that term sheet? Um, at the angel level, the early stage, a lot of entrepreneurs take advantage of convertible notes or safes. Um, and I'm sure they'll be able to speak to those, but the convertible note really allows you to defer having the valuation conversation, which can sometimes be contentious because you're an entrepreneur and you think your company is worth a lot and the VC may you know, have comps that say otherwise. So in order to avoid that conversation or kind of kick that can down the road, a lot of people in the early stage use convertible notes or safes. As you're all talking, I see people taking notes, which is great. Um, so, Slil, to your point, I mean, what are some terms that people should be familiar with before they even start these conversations? Because, you know, obviously it's not something you want to Google under the table real quick <laughs> in the moment. Yeah, so, so I think there's, I think to even to take a step back, you know, the term sheet is also part of your relationship building with the, with the VC or the investor. It's important to what the investor puts in there. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's, there's some short term sheets. You might get something that's, you know, one page or half a page that says, here's how much we're gonna invest, here's the valuation of the company, and then we'll get all other rights that are customary in the industry. And it could be that, that short, otherwise you could see 10 page term sheets that, that really list out every, every key term that you're gonna see across those 100 pages of the documents in great detail. And I think um, it, it's a good time to think about, you know, what is your relationship with, you know, with your potential investor because it really is a partnership, unlike, let's say a merger or an acquisition where, where you're selling the company and, and once you sell the company, you're no longer involved. This is really the beginning of what could be a five, six, seven, ten year you know, partnership. So it's really important to, to think about it that way. In terms of the terms, I think you know, the main term to think about obviously is a financial terms, right? You, you, you want to know what the investor is offering, how much they're going to invest, and, and how much of the company you're selling. Because I think that that's a headline to get there. And I think that's really also a business conversation between you, know, you as a founder and then your investors. I think a lot of the other terms that are important are, are around governance, around the other rights. A lot of those tend to be a little more customary. And, and you know, we, can, we, especially lawyers, kind of walk you through, and a, a big part of our job is education. It's what are all these terms? What do they mean? And sometimes, as egregious as they sound on paper, how do they actually turn out in the real world? Because a lot of what we'll say is, I know that sounds bad, but here's how the story you know, unfolds. Here's the end of the story, and here's why it's not that bad for you. And so I think that's part of the job. So I think the financing key is, is kind of the, the piece that you really want to understand going in, because it's often the thing you do prior to having a lawyer involved. I got it. You made a point about some terms seeming egregious, right? So when I hear things like dilution, I think, well, that can't be good. Um, so just from your perspectives, um, you know, what does that actually mean? How does that affect the, the actual agreement? Sure. So, so dilution essentially is a concept that says if you own a percentage of the company, when you take on financing, your percentage will be lowered, right? So if you own 100% of the company, you sell 20%, you'll be down to 80. You're diluted by 20%. So dilution is a reality of venture financing. Unlike, let's say, real estate financing, where you say, I need to acquire this piece of land, I need to build this building, and that's going to cost me you know, $10 million to the land, $3 million of construction, 
it's project finance. It's, it's 13 million, that's what I need. It's a closed capital system. In the startup community, we don't know what we're gonna need ultimately to get from you know, day one to success. And, and we don't even know necessarily what success looks like. So the goal is to take as much money as you need to get to the next hurdle or the next break point of your company. Maybe that's going from you know, a pitch book idea to an actual workable model. Maybe that's going from a workable model to your first million dollars uh, of revenue. Whatever those hurdles are, that, that's what you want to hit. And so the goal is to take as much money as you need to get to that next hurdle. Hopefully your valuation goes up so you take less dilution on, right? Because with every round of financing, the higher the valuation, the same dollars will buy less of the company. And so that, that's really the goal and kind of how this works. And there's an alignment of interest between you as founder and your early investors as well. Yeah, and I, I think to that point, um, like you said, it is a reality of raising venture capital. I think when you also kind of t take a step back, what the venture investor is doing is they're basically giving you money that you're likely to lose. And we're likely to never see it back. Um, we make a bet, we make a portfolio bet, which is why we invest in so many companies, that some will be hit it out of the park, some will just kind of struggle, some will be a great idea at the wrong time. Like there's an assumption that you're actually gonna lose money on a majority of your investments or maybe make it back on some. And so um, founders, um, you know, I think the recommendation is to think about dilution as like a somewhat even trade of us giving a founder capital with the risk that you might lose it. And if things go sideways, you don't pay it back. And so like selling 20% of your business, like maybe not a bad trade for a couple million bucks. And, and it's, a, it's a really interesting frame to think about because uh, like you said, over time, founders get diluted, but over time, your earliest investors also get diluted. So we might make an investment and own 10% of your company, but if you raise a Series A, Series B, Series C, Series D, our ownership is gonna go down to maybe 5%, maybe 3%, maybe 1%. So for example, we're investors in companies like Casper and Warby Parker and Allbirds, and the percentage we owned at the beginning is not the percentage now, but the value has increased so significantly. It's better to own a small percentage of something big than a large percentage of something small. And so over time, everyone gets diluted, and that is a little bit of the reality. Um, but the, the idea is we're betting on you to increase the value of that percentage point. Um, so a bit of context there. And just to hit on one of your other points and looking at this kind of fundraising as a journey and hitting milestones. So some new entrepreneurs, I invest pretty early stage, they'll come in and say, okay, our company needs $5 million because we're gonna do all of these things, but do you really need $5 million for the next you know, 18 months. So you wanna think of this in stages because you don't wanna take on more money than you need because you don't wanna give away too much of your company cheaply. Um, when you're first starting out, your companies are gonna be valued lower, right? So after you get to a million dollars in sales, your values will be higher. So you don't wanna give away too much of your company um, cheaply. So you want to think about, okay, for the next 12 to 18 months, what are my milestones? What am I going to promise to these investors? And th how, can, how much is it going to cost me to deliver on that? T and then that's how much money you raise for 18 months. Next 18 months, so you hit all those milestones, you go back to the investors, and they have a little bit more confidence in your ability to go the next distance. So you have your next milestones. You go back to them and say, I delivered on all these milestones. Now we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and now I need 1.5 million dollars for that. And so that's how you want to think about this journey and, um, and how you kind of break it up. Because a lot of people come to us and they're like, but I can't you know, get to my vision without $5 million. But you might get to that $5 million, but you might not do it, um, you know, might not need all the money at once. I mean, and one, one great exercise that we recommend that founders do, and especially for the folks here that haven't seen a term sheet is, um, come up with a bit of a cap table or make a, make a small cap table. You can learn how to do it online. Uh, your friends can kind of show you. you. There are all sorts of kind of great blog posts and things like that. And see what happens to your ownership over a couple of fundraising rounds. And you can model things and there are great examples of what actually happens. And that's a really good visual way to see um, how dilution works and what happens over time because I think at that first that very first negotiation, if I'm a solo founder and you come into my office and we think you're fabulous and we want to invest and we give you a term sheet, um, you're going to be selling probably 20% of your company. And so you're going to go from owning 100% to 80%. And then I'm going to say to you, hey, also to, do, to really hit it out of the park and build an amazing business, you're going to need to hire an amazing team. So now you also need to reserve 10% of your, your equity for new employees. And so now you've just gone from 100% 
to 80% um, to 70%. And that's before you've done anything. And so it's, you gotta get comfortable with that. You've gotta think through that. Um, it's a very different mentality. And it's one that's very common in the venture landscape. It's, it's, not, it's very different than going to a bank and getting a loan. It's very different than um, finding people that will give you money for free. So it's a bit of a different animal. So it takes a bit of thinking and um, conceptualizing to get comfortable with it. Because it it's a bit of a tough pill to swallow if you don't have a ton of exposure. Yeah, you know, it's funny as you're talking, I mean, two things really strike me. One is the need to just manage your expectations, right? You know, like, what are you, what are you going to potentially going to get and what are some changes you're going to have to make, you know, throughout the, you know, the time when you're, you know, seeking this investment. And another is just, just literally just empathizing with the people who are, you know, investing in you, right? Like, they might never see this again. And they have, like, four or five other companies that, you know, unfortunately didn't make it. So that's why they might have to say what they're saying. Um, so just thank you for that perspective um, already. Um, but, you know, one thing, like, Ricardo, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Just going deeper into the terminology here, what is the difference between preferred and common stock um, stockholders? And then beyond that, you know, we also have founder stock. So what happens if a founder leaves the company? How does that impact the, the sure. terms? Sure. So it's, you know, at, at a high level, you know, preferred investors are typically minority investors. So most, uh, most investors that are going to be minority investors are not really going to be involved in the day-to-day -day decision of the company as part of management, they want to have a little bit more protection. And so the way they get that is through a higher ranking in the, in the, cap, in the cap structure. So preferred is typically for minority investors. Common is typically for founders or other people who are involved in the day-to-day -day of the company. You know, two important considerations with preferred, um, you know, as, you, as you bring it into your cap and your cap structure. One is, as I mentioned, in terms of ranking. So, Typically, the way you think through it is debt, then preferred, then common in the event of a liquidation if something needs to be wound up. Um, you know, so you know you got to think through that because you know people will get paid ahead of you. And the second is really on the liquidation preference. So, in in the event that you know the company either gets sold um, or uh, down case scenario the company gets liquidated. In some instances, the preferred would actually be able to get more than one times whatever they put in. So that's kind of the liquidation preference. So let's say you know, it gets sold for $100 million, and you know, they invested you know, $50 million, and they have a two times liquidation preference. In an extreme example, all that month, the $100 million would go to the uh, preferred investor because that they have a two times liquidation preference and the common shareholders wouldn't have anything left at that point in time. So it's important to really consider who's gonna be ahead of you and the reason why they're, they're gonna be ahead of you in the, in the ranking, because you're ultimate, they're not making the day-to-day -day decision on how you're impacting the business. Um, so that, those are kind of the, the different things to consider. As it relates to the founders owning stock, they can continue to own the stock you know, and, and not being involved in the company, that they really wouldn't be affected from an equity ownership perspective. Yeah, you know, if they have common stock, obviously they'll be uh, similar to the other uh, common stockholders. So that's a, so it's a really, um, I think a really like thoughtful way to break it down. I think one thing that I see time and time again, particularly in tech press, is these massive, massive fundraises and then these, these exits. And you know, typically I see an exit that's not that, that much higher than the last round of financing. And so what happens is you read this tech press and you're like, oh my gosh, everyone gets rich. The early employees, the later employees, someone who just joined. And that's actually not true because there is this, there is this layer of preferred investors. So it's actually like the valuation price minus all the preference of these investors. Maybe there's debt, subtract that. And then you get a percentage of what's left. And it's often not that much. And so you really have to be careful about how you structure um, kind of that preference stack. And, and no one really talks about it. And so the insight is just so, so, so powerful because there is a rank order of who gets paid out in an exit um, or a liquidation. And, and it's something that um, no one really talks about. And it's very, very important to think about either as a startup founder or a startup employee. Yeah, the, the one thing I will add to that, and I think I mentioned this earlier, especially when you're taking the early stages of rounds and, and you know, from a, from, from a kind of angel investor and an early stage investor, you know, as, as a company grows, they will look more like common in that stack, right? So you have uh, potential preferences where not only 
will the preferred sit on top of the common, but every series of preferreds, so the A could be below the B, below the C. So, so there's a real alignment of interest again where you know, your early investors will want to create things that are more democratic, if you will, where if there is a horizontal exit and you are tapping into that, that liquidation preference, that everyone gets to participate kind of pro rata or peri passu, so that way you know, the investors can kind of get back their money at least on the same percentage versus kind of having that four stack. And I think you, know, you can really work with your investors early to set up a system that works kind of going forward and is kind of fair across the board. And I think beyond all of the terms and the term sheet, I think it's really important to think about who's giving you the term sheet. Is this somebody that you want to work with for the next eight to 10 years? Because these are long relationships. So if you're having a tumultuous um, negotiation situation, you have to think, how is this going to be at a board meeting when I have an issue and we have a disagreement? Is this person somebody who's going to support me? Is this somebody who can believe in my company? Is this somebody who can help me raise the next round? Is this a strategic person that can get me in front of the right client? So not just thinking about what the terms are in the sheet, but beyond the terms, what can this person bring to you? And it might make up for maybe a lack of evaluation. Maybe you think you should be valued higher, but because this investor is bringing so much more to the table, you might give on some certain, um, some certain principles in your term sheet. Yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, ease of doing business, you know, what's the value of that when you actually want to take someone's phone call or, you know, you enjoy meeting with them versus it being contentious, right? So that can uh, make or break, you know, a lot of situations. And, um, you know, you mentioned valuations. So just, Ricardo, lo love to hear your thoughts on this too. You know, it's often mentioned, you know, it's obviously been mentioned in a term seat. You know, how much does it really matter? And, you know, how much give and take should you be willing to, yeah. to offer with that? Oh, it, it, it absolutely matters. It matters mm -hmm. because it does determine the dilution that we were talking about earlier, right? It is how much is the company worth today? And so as a result, the size of the, the check that the investor is writing, what percentage does that represent in terms of ownership going forward? And what percentage is left for those, for those who already own the company? So it absolutely matters. However, that wouldn't be the only thing you should focus on. There are many instances where an investor is willing to give you a billion dollar valuation, but then have other features in there like a three, four, five times liquidation preference, as we talked about, to protect their downside. So they may be believers that yes, if, it, if it's a home run, everybody wins, so everyone's happy. But if things go sideways or go down, then you really um, are not gonna be you know, ad taking advantage of that high uh, watermark valuation. So, you know, many, many companies and many founders really get caught up in either being a unicorn or having a high watermark valuation and they lose sight of the other terms that are equally important. So valuation, absolutely important, not the only thing to focus on. And, and one thing we see at The Seed is, um, <laughs> is, you know, people really want great valuations right out of the gate, but I think one important factor of an evaluation or evaluation is that like, kind of like you said, like, um, you really got to think about when things go sideways. Like, entrepreneurship and startups, it is inevitable that things will go wrong. You just don't know when. And so when you're thinking about your valuation, you need to find a number that you're comfortable with that if things go sideways, you can create more value than that number so you can raise it a higher valuation in the next round. I think there's a, there's a, it's really detrimental for a company to come to us and want a very high valuation because the expectation is they need to meet or exceed that within 18 months to raise their next round of financing. Otherwise, to fund the business, they're gonna to have to suffer some, some very, very serious solution. And so you wanna find that number that is realistic and reasonable and you can effectively beat with the time that you have. That's, that's a great point. Uh, oftentimes when we're advising companies on a subsequent capital raise, we sometimes get feedback from investors saying, well, they haven't really earned the valuation from last round. They haven't grown into it quite yet. So you either are looking to do a flat round in terms of valuation at the same price, even though you've exceeded your own internal expectations and, and achieved different milestones. So that's not great from a branding and validation perspective. Or if the, the business hasn't really exceeded your expectations, it may be a down round and that doesn't help with morale internally with your employees. It doesn't help with some of the customers you may want to be pursuing as you grow and, and scale. So absolutely great point. You want to make sure that you're at a valuation that you feel comfortable and that you're not having to grow so much into it that the subsequent round is one that would be in question. And 
To add to that, in these seed stage rounds, what we're seeing at Pipeline Angels is an average valuation at about four to five million. If this is your first kind of seed round, that's kind of what we're seeing for New York, for the coast. Um, in the middle, in the south, we see valuations typically around three to four million. So that's just to give you a little bit of perspective. And these are people, they, you know, they may have some revenues, they may not, but it all usually falls around four to five million that we see um, unless you're you know a super hot company you may be up to like eight to ten but we usually don't see those at this early stage so I think one of the things you want to make sure is that you don't go in there with this crazy valuation because that can deter and turn off investors very quickly and, and be quite you know you want to be credible and you want to you know obviously establish you know credibility with the investors because they're going to be a partner for the for the long term you know I think you, you bring up a great point, which is, you know, how do you even come up with a valuation number, right? One is for you to actually be thoughtful about, well, what sort of company am I? And who would be the relevant companies as I think about, you know, the universe that I'm, you know, in the ecosystem with? What do they trade at if they were public companies? Or what was the last round that they did on the private? So that you think about it as a multiple of forward revenue, as a multiple of EBITDA, if you're already uh, generating EBITDA. Uh, but you know, think about why you're asking for a certain valuation. And the other part of it is, is also maybe not negotiate against yourself and, and see what investors are willing to ascribe to you before you actually put forth a number. I feel like I negotiate against myself constantly. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like always guessing what the founder kind of wants and then I'm rationalizing why I should do it or why I shouldn't. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a, it's a real like stress. Um, but one way I would think about valuation, there are like a lot of ways to think about valuation. I think that's a, that's a fabulous way. Um, you know, I think it's a bit of a sliding scale. So like when you raise seed financing, you're gonna be selling 20 to 30% of your business. Maybe a little less than 20 if you're particularly experienced or you're a serial entrepreneur or um, you've got a great team and your co-founder is like stellar and well-known in the space. Like the minimum you'd be selling selling 15 to 20%. If you're inexperienced and you're unproven and you're building a product or a service in a very risky market that's totally unproven and we're guessing the world would be in a certain direction, you're gonna start sliding closer and closer to that 30% number. Um, and typically what you'll do with evaluation is you just think about the amount that you're raising um, divided by basically the percentage you're selling, right? So if you're raising 5 million divided by 0.2, you know, you'll get whatever number that is, which I'm not gonna do, which is very easy math, but I'm on video and I've done it wrong before. Um, but, but basically you can just do kind of this math and you can see what the bands of reality are. So if you're raising 5 million bucks and you're selling 20% of your company, like if it's your first round of financing, you've just, you're just in outer space, it's not gonna happen. Um, and so you can kind of think about what the investor is gonna be thinking and what they're gonna be kind of inclined to do. I would say seed investors are typically trying to own about 10 to 15%. And so you can think about what, what is in the realm of, of reality there. Um, and that's a good way to kind of back into a range. Um, the best way to negotiate valuation is to always have another term sheet and have a better offer on the table. That's really the only way you can, you can lever up where a deal gets really hot and pretty competitive. And so um, that's great and that's, that's fabulous if you can do that. And we're, we're um, typically okay to kind of negotiate, but you have to, you have to make sure that that is real um, you can't pit firms against each other um, it, if it's not actually happening because the, the negative side of that is venture firms talk and we share deals all the time and we talk about opportunities and particularly seed funds, we love to invest together. Um, so you wanna be careful if you play that game, but it, if you can play that game, um, you should absolutely do that. You know, with that, so while you're trying to keep this term sheet warm, right, while you're shopping it around, Ricardo, I'd love to hear your, um, your, you know, your, your response on this. What's the best way to keep it warm as you're shopping this around? Because it's clear, it's obvious, right? If you get the term machine, it's like been like three days, it's like, all right, well, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna do this for yeah. what? <laughs> it's a great point, and I'm in between two investors, so I have to be careful on how I respond. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think part of it is how, whether the, the term sheet is solicited or unsolicited. And what I, what I mean by that is if you're meeting with an investor, or, you know, you've had a couple of discussions with them, and then all of a sudden they, they serve you a term sheet, right? Like you weren't necessarily asking for it. You weren't really kind of talking to a, a multitude of them. And so I think it's okay in that context to have other conversations and, and be, again, you, this is a partner, a prospective partner that you're gonna have either in this round 
or in a future round. So, and you know, to the earlier point, this is a community that speaks and is very close knit. So you, you want to start on the right foot. So first and foremost, you know, obviously being honest and transparent is very important. Um, and then, you know, if it's, if it's something where you are talking to different people and now you have a term sheet, you know, part of it is, have you signed the term sheet? If you haven't signed the term sheet, then it gives you more latitude, right? And you can just be a little bit more upfront and say, you know, I'm actually in the middle of having other conversations and I want to make sure that I see how those shake out before I commit to something more formal. If the term sheet is signed, you are agreeing, A, not to disclose any information that is in that term sheet, so all that information is confidential, including the, the, the party, including the name of the investor with whom you're, you've entered into that term sheet. So there, there are different ways of keeping it warm insofar as you're, A, being honest and transparent and kind of building the right credibility. Investors self-servingly are going to be pushing you to sign a term sheet as, as soon as possible but they also understand that for great companies, great founders, people with credibility, they have choices and they have multiple choices. So you want to use that leverage in your favor. And the best time to raise capital is when you don't have a gun to your head. So do that in your planning as well. When am I going to need capital? How much am I going to need? And let's make sure I start having those conversations earlier on. So you do have the flexibility of keeping them warm because you're not having to take the first offer that comes to you. Some investors will actually um, expire their term sheet. So they'll give you seven days to make a decision or seven days to sign. Um, and that's a way for them to make sure that you're not necessarily shopping the deal or, or trying to find a better offer while their offer's on the table. Investors have um, big egos and um, no one likes to lose a deal. No one likes to lose. And so I personally think that when a term sheet is on the table, your process has started and you've got to go and you've got five days to figure it out. Um, no, most investors don't really want to hang around the hoop and go back and forth for two weeks and not know if we're working together or not. Um, so you have to be very sensitive to that. Um, and um, and, and uh, you know it's good to keep options open, but you also have to remember you're working with a person across the table. They're saying, hey, we did the thing, which is we gave you the term sheet. We papered this. We want to work with you. Um, no one else has done what we've done. And so um, you can give people a little bit of credit for being first and kind of really ponying up with that. But, but um, you know, I totally agree with you. Like, you've got to find, you've got to do the best thing for your company. And you've got to make sure you're talking to the best investors for your company. But once you get a term sheet, um, you've got to do that incredibly quickly. And so it's important to plan your process and plan your meetings. Um, one thing that I, I think is actually pretty helpful is you can always say, hey, I have a term sheet. Um, I, you know, I, I'd really like to spend more time with you. Can we accelerate our decision? I have to make a decision on this term sheet. And investors will know what that means and they'll kind of jump and they'll get to a yes or a no pretty quickly. Um, it's kind of like having a, having a job interview and saying you've got an offer somewhere else. Like you can totally do that and that's okay. Um, you just have to kind of be open and honest and communicative about that. Yeah, I think we always tell companies that, that, that it's a dialogue. It's, you know, it's like dating. You just want to be upfront about where you are in the process, what your expectations are. Um, if, you, if you know you're going to receive a term sheet from somebody, letting the other parties that you want to be as part of your process know that timeline. Because you also don't want to catch them off guard, right? If, you, if you, there's someone you're interested in, in, in working with, you also don't want to go to them after you, you, know, you sat on a term sheet for three days because then they have to accelerate their process. And they just, as much as they might want to, they might not be able to get that through their investment committee, through, through their partnership. So again, it's just being really communicative uh, about that process. And again, it's a very small community and you will often want to work with the same people again. So you just don't know where, where they're going to come back. And so you want to be really fair with people across the board. And I think, and I think that, that frankly, we see it on both sides of the aisle. When, when we represent the investors, we, you know, we try to be equally the same and, and be, be fair and, and responsive to the companies. Yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, you're dealing with another individual on the other side. And so you want to also understand what the level of reasonableness is with you as well, right? Like if they're pressuring you to sign a term sheet, you want to make sure that you've kind of gotten enough counsel and understand what you're committing to, right? Because once you've signed the term sheet, your options are very limited, right? And it's harder to negotiate something better than what you already agreed to up front. So, you want to understand who are you dealing with, why is there such a, you know, such an urgency on the other side, if it's something that, you know, can it be, you know, slowed down a little bit more, and what do you need to show them to demonstrate that you're interested in a partnership with them, but while at the same time kind of doing what's best for you on the company. 
So and I, there's, one, there's one kind of nuance here I want to make sure we, we're, we're clear about. So um, signing a term sheet is not a done deal. You'll go through uh, maybe a month, maybe more, hopefully less. You'll go through an extended period of time of deep diligence where an investor will ask for bank statements. They'll ask for old board decks. They'll ask for anything and everything about your business. They'll do background checks. They'll do things like that. There are many ways that a deal can fall apart from the time you um, sign a term sheet to when you actually get cash in the bank. So I firmly believe that a deal is not done until money is wired into your account. Um, you know, for the most part, venture is a reputation-based business, and so um, it's rare that a deal will get pulled. But um, you want to make sure that you're very buttoned up, that you're being honest and ethical about what's going on, because things can happen. Um, so a term sheet is just an agreement saying, hey, I agree to want to work with you. I'm going to ask a bunch of people about you and do some diligence, but it's not going to be a month until we make this formal. And so, um, you know, Silo, you could probably talk much more about that, but it's something I, it's a nuance I just want to make sure we, we put a fine point on. And, and for the founders or the companies, it, because of the deep diligence that the investor is going to do, it doesn't typically get better for the founder, right? Like it, you're agreeing to at least the baseline. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think in the early stages, it, it, it rarely, I do think that people live by their term sheets, right? There's a difference in the financing world than, than let's say, in, in the merger and acquisition world and even in the later stage financing world. Once you have a valuation, once you have a set of terms, rarely, if ever, have I seen, you know, uh, an investor come back and say, you know, we, we did our diligence and, you know, we, we gave you X as your valuation, but we're going to take 20% off that, right? I think people will live by that. I think what they're looking for are, are really red flags for the business. Do you not own the IP that you said you own? Do you not own the percentage of the company that you said you own? Because you had some, some wayward uh, founder who happened to have 50%, right? So I think that process is, while, while it's not done, the, the expectation is that it will get done. And what we often talk about is confirmatory diligence, that, that, that we're not looking to find red flags, that we're not looking to, to, to change the valuation, to change the terms. It's really to, to, to make sure that everything you told us about the company is a company from the investor side, and I think it's really important, you know, I think Ricardo said, to, ha to have your house in order, right? You, you want to make sure you go into that process with, you know, your IP ownership set and confirmed, that, that your cap table, which is, you know, who owns equity and how much they own, that, that that's set, it's definitive, you have backup documentation to all that, because investors will come in and they will look at every last document, every last equity grant, down to the board minutes that approved it to the actual grant paperwork, right? And they, they will tick and tie that. So, so it's really important to, to make sure that that's all in order. And it's also really important to be responsive. So in your diligence room, if you don't have everything and an investor reaches out to you that they need a document, don't wait three or four days to get back to them. Make that your priority that day, because as we're doing diligence, we're also seeing what it's going to be like to work with you. Are you someone who's responsive? Are you someone who is fully transparent? Um, and those are the kind of things we're thinking about, because again, this is a long-term relationship, and we want to make sure we're partnering with someone that we have confidence and believe in. You made a point about being responsive, right? So you get this offer, like you're going to you know, respond or not. A lot of people track their opens on their emails, right? So they see that you open it four times on your phone and twice on your desktop and you still want to answer that one question. That's always a red flag. So just, you know, make sure you are doing that. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> just so you know. Um, but, you know, so actually going back to you, I think we have an opportunity here to pass along some hard skills as well as some soft skills in regards to what's going on in a term sheet and in, my, in this case, how to negotiate it. So I'm just wondering, what can you negotiate in, you know, how much should you negotiate? Where is the line between, you know, being a good business person and being a little bit annoying um, by the amount of back and forth you have? Right. Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, you're going to get this term sheet, you know, it, it could be, you know, take the full blown NVCA, the National Venture Capital Association form. It's, it's seven to 10 pages. It, it, it goes into great depth on each of the provisions. So I think a lot of it is education, right? So step one is understanding what each of these terms mean and why they're important for your business and how they can affect your business, right? And I think when you do that, and, and you know, a lot of what we do is, is go through that education process, sit down with the client, go through it step by step and say, this is what it's important, try to, you know, in some cases alleviate concerns, try to explain you know, how these play out. And again, it's, it's thinking about how the entire you know, movie is gonna play to the very end. Um, you know, one of the greatest things that, that, that first-time founders always, you know, get very anxious about 
you know, investors always ask for a block on, on uh, the next financing round and blocks on sell selling the company. People are like, it's my company, if you're only selling 20%, I still own 80% of it, why can't I sell my company? I, everyone knows I need more money, why can't I go raise money you know, without their approval? And again, it's, it's important to pick your partners well because if you, if you have partners like this, you know, you know that they're, they're their interests are aligned with you and they're gonna do right by you. But it's really a, about finding you know, where that alignment is and then driving from there. So, so there are places that you can, you can negotiate, right? And, and I think it's about picking your battles, mm -hmm. about what's important to you, what's important to your company, knowing that there's just a standard set of terms that, that any VC you go to is gonna ask for. Um, and so it's trying to, trying to separate those that are kind of standard terms that, that you know, will play out in, in a normal way from those that are very business specific. Um, you know, valuation obviously is one that, that will be very company specific. Sometimes you know, investors will ask you to, to vest or revest in your equity. Hey, I've been at this company for four years before I took any financing. I own my stock and now you, you tell me that if I leave the business, I'm gonna lose some percentage of that. That's one, especially at the seed stage, it becomes a conversation with your investors. And again, they're just trying to create alignment of interest that, that way you don't take the money and, and then you go sit on the beach because you already own your 80% of the business, right? So, so, so it's about working through the, those norms and try to create a, you know, alignment of interest. Mm -hmm. And again, I think because it is such a relationship, you wanna really think about you know, what matters to you and articulate that in a meaningful way and, and separate that from the personal of, I'm just giving stuff up and I, and I owned 100% of this, so I, I, I just don't wanna give anything up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when negotiating a term sheet or, or you know, for that matter, you wanna kinda do it holistically yeah. Not just you know one discussion on one point, then another discussion, another point. You want to think about you know what is this holistic agreement that I'm entering into? What is the interplay between valuation and this other clause in here? So how do I think about it holistically? Because the investor is going to be thinking about it holistically. They're going to put it in their model and they're going to figure out okay what happens in this scenario, what happens in this scenario, what happens in that scenario, and that obviously has moving pieces. So you want to think about it holistically and not necessarily just one, you know, one item per conversation. I think that is, that is such an important point because I think that can be the most annoying thing that happens. Um, and because the deal changes when you ask for different things. And so when we talk about interconnectivity of deal elements, um, to get specific, if, if I know I want to own 10% of a company, I'm going to give you a certain pre-money price and I'm going to give you a certain post-money price. And that's going to be, the difference is the amount of money that you raise. And so if we agree to that and we sign a term sheet and I know how my math works and then you go out and you talk to a bunch of great investors and a lot of people want to give you money and you think, well, wait a second, not only do I want one million, I want, I can raise two or three million, I'm going to go raise two to three million. And then you, then you come back to us and you say, hey, I want to raise more money and we're like, great, that's fabulous, but you have to take the dilution hit because we've already agreed on this deal. And founders are like, whoa, 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 like, you know, I don't want to take any dilution. And it's like, well, we wouldn't have given you this pre-money if you were raising this amount of money. We would have given you significantly less because our math works out for a certain ownership percentage. And founders come back and they think, well, you thought my company was valued five million a week ago, and now you're telling me it's valued two, like three million. And um, I think the reality is your your company's really valued at zero if you don't if you don't have anything yet, and you're raising off of a pitch deck. And we're just kind of coming up with math to get to something that we want to get to. And so that's one way where there are all these dynamics at play, um, where when you negotiate these small points, like hey, I want to raise more money, and like things are going well, it changes the deal. And so. Another dynamic of that is we've signed a term sheet. I've gone back to my team and I've said, this is the deal we're taking, we're really excited about it, this is how much we're putting in, this is the ownership, and if a founder wants to make changes, um, I work for my team. And so I have to go back to the team and I have to say, hey, you know, this founder wants to do this different deal, or can you guys approve it, what do you think? And they're like, okay, yes, 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 I'll approve it. And then you come back to me two weeks later and you wanna make another change. And so now I have to go back to my team again. This is time number three that I'm trying to sell a deal. Not even sell a deal, but I'm trying to update my partnership. And they're looking at me and they're saying, why isn't this getting done? What's going on with these tiny, these tiny nits? We need to like, allow them to raise more money and just move on. And so the more updates you have and the more changes you have from an original agreement, the more conversations that anyone has to have with their team, partner or not, you have to update your team. And that's where things start to get a little frustrating 
Um, and that's where the holistic view really becomes critically important. And, and most investors, they do this day in and day out. I just got off a couple months where I probably negotiated five or six term sheets. Like I'm doing this all day, every day, and I know what my team can do and I know what we can. And so for a founder, it's really important. It's like the most important thing for their company in this moment. And I honor that and I value that. Um, but there are some things we're gonna do and we can't do. And it's sometimes better just to figure out what's important to you, talk about them, agree to them, and then, and then move on. Um, and I think that's a hard thing for founders to kind of think and, and believe. And so I caution you guys to, and, and the folks in the audience to, if you're going to negotiate certain points or ask about certain things, maybe practice it with your lawyer first. Maybe talk about all the things that you want to talk about and get some advice and perspective from them. Um, because, you know, to kind of bring it full circle, it is the beginning of a relationship. And it is um, how we're going to work with you and how you're going to work with us. And, and if we feel like we're getting taken advantage of, and you feel like you're getting taken advantage of, that's not a good thing. Um, so you want to drive to a deal close as fast as possible. And, and I really think that like a good deal is where everyone's a little bit unhappy. Like that is like the best deal, right? Like you're generally happy, but you're a little bit unhappy. And, it, and the best deal is a done deal. And so all of these things kind of come up. And you can preempt this by getting familiar with the terms, talking to your lawyer, um, thinking holistically, which I just think is so important and so critical. Um, and then like maybe limiting yourself to like two back and forths and then you gotta move on, I think. And I think you guys both touched on lawyer, lawyer, good counsel. Raise your hand if you have a lawyer. That's gonna be very important when you're raising a term sheet. A lot of these, when you're raising funds and, and coming up with these term sheets, because a lot of these pitfalls can be avoided by good counsel. So if you don't have a lawyer, um, I would, you know, that sometimes they're expensive to have on a retainer. You might wanna reach out there's some organizations that can help you um, get pro bono lawyers. There's some angel groups that you could reach out to that can help tell you where these resources are because that's really important to have a lawyer because you can Google and you can try to learn these terms, but like she said, investors are looking at these and doing five term machines a week. You'll never get to the level that they are and you shouldn't have to. You're a founder, you're not a lawyer. So let the lawyers do their jobs and just hire a good one. My check cleared. <laughs> but, um, I, I couldn't agree more. It, it is, I, you know, it is what we do every day, right? Our job is to help you through this process. This is, this is the, my bread and butter is doing these venture deals, right? It, 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 you know, and, and it's similarly for the investors, this is what they do day in, day out, right? So, so we can just be a resource. And again, I, I've said education a couple times It's because that, that's, that's really where we, we come in the, the, you know, handy. It's, it's the drafting and making sure the terms are right, but it, it's really understanding what they are, making sure you understand what they are, and then again, seeing how that story plays out. Because again, I think that's what's so crucial. It, it's because in a vacuum, you can Google, you can understand some of these terms. And, and you know, my job is to think about the worst case scenario in every context, right? That I, I lead a pretty depressing life in that way. <laughs> but, but, but that's the job, and, and in some cases it's, Yes, that could be a possibility, but that's 99% of the time not, not how the story pans out, right? So, so I think it's, it's really important to have that and to have that support so, so it's not just on you. You can focus on building the business, on, on you know, utilizing those funds, but, but to rely on somebody else for, for things that aren't in your wheelhouse. It's just not what you do, do day in, day out. And so I think a great question for lawyers, yeah. like one thing I love it when our founders ask our lawyers is what is entrepreneur friendly, what is investor friendly, and what's somewhere in the middle? And a lawyer can answer that so you can see both perspectives. Um, and then the second question is what is going to get renegotiated in the next round? So as seed investors, um, you know, there are kind of, there are business points which are really important and there's kind of tactical legal rights that are really important, but we know that if a company is successful, a Series A fund is going to come in and they're going to have their own lawyer and they're going to, they have the option to kind of redo and revise everything. And so in some senses, everything is renegotiable. And so for a seed investor, we're thinking, what are the terms that we can agree to that's going to set them up for success that aren't really going to have to be renegotiated or where's the line where we can kind of squeeze them under so they're not renegotiated, but that's totally on the table. And so when you're considering what you should negotiate or not, asking your lawyer what's on the table is always a really good, good question. Yeah, I think that, that, that's absolutely right. Because I, I, again, because the, the story will continue to go on and once you have new investors come in, they have their own ideas, but 
but a lot of what your job is in that early stage is to, to bring on investors you like, bring on partners you like, and to set the stage of the company. I, I really think of that seed round as a foundation, right? It, it's, it's where you're setting the general terms, and you know, most of these deals can be, can be a lot of paper for what is sometimes a small investment, because you are setting all those terms. You're, you're doing things like establishing registration rights. So registration rights are, are what happens if the investor, if, if you go public, what rights do the investors to sell out on, on, on the private market? When you're taking a million dollar check, that's probably, the, you know, that's the goal, but, but that could be years out. But what you're doing, you're, you're again, you're establishing the foundation for, for where, where other investors are gonna come along, what rights that they're gonna agree to. And so again, it's really about setting that, those terms in, in a way that's fair for you, for, for your investors, and more importantly, as you as a group are aligned going forward when you're raising that D round, that E round, to make sure that, that there's alignment across the your capitalization table. And you know, it's, it's interesting, um, as you're all talking, one thing I'm realizing is, realizing is a lot of your job is, first of all, correcting behaviors so you can start moving towards desired outcomes, right? And you know, you, you've touched on it to an extent, but there are some like, you know, nuanced behaviors that just aren't really helpful to the process. So I want to open this up, and this is going to be great for everyone to, to take notes on. What are just some pet peeves that happen in the negotiating process that just irk you? And no one's trying to annoy anybody, right? Um, but it's like, it's not knowing these things. Like, what are some things that just, that just irk you to an extent? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with there because I'm, I'm, like, I'm always oh, no. I'm the puppet Nothing, master yeah, that, uh, that's, right. that, that's behind the company. But but look, I, I think you know we've, we've mentioned a couple of things. I think being upfront and holistic, I think, is super important because one of the things that that bothers me is when, when a client comes to me and says, "Hey, here's a term sheet. Here's here's three terms. I was so angry about them. I called the VC and, and we we've now agreed to this, and then they've left a whole host of other issues unresolved." And then when you go back to the VC to negotiate those, it's like, well, I thought we were done. I thought you told me what your important parts are. But you know, from your perspective as a company, you may not have known how important these other three terms were because they weren't maybe valuation, they weren't dilution, right? Which are, are things you're gonna focus on. So I think doing things holistically, creating a clear line of dialogue, I think is super important across both sides. So when I work with clients, I wanna make sure that they feel comfortable calling me, that, that we're either communicating directly with, with investors council or that, that the roles are clear because otherwise sometimes there's cross communication and then, and then that's where the hurt feelings start, right? It's, it's you know, founder VC have talked, they've agreed to something, you know, lawyers come in, now that deal is torn up or the lawyers talk, we agree to something and then, it, then, then the business people say, oh, I, I've already given on that, right? It, it's about making sure that communication is clear because again, it, it's a process and it's a relationship. So I think those are the two biggest ones that, that I see on my side. Um, I mean, I, I guess the, the other thing that comes into play a lot when negotiating, you want to make sure that you're either speaking to the right decision maker yeah. or that that person has the authority to act on the behalf of the other party <laughs> and that you yourself have already kind of gone internally and gotten the approvals that you need on your side. So when you're representing something to the, you know, to the other party, that you're acting on good faith. And so when something comes back and, you know, then you then have to go back and check with some people that you should have checked with originally, and then you're having to kind of be on your back foot as opposed to always being on the front foot. I'll give some like specific fun nits that I'm just like thinking of all these deals. Um, like literally the easiest negotiation that ever happened was a couple, for me, was a couple months ago where we gave a valuation and we gave, which we thought was fair, and he came back and he was like, you know, like, I think it could be a little higher, but like, on the whole, I'm like really excited to work with you. I think like it's worth it to work with you. So like, I'm cool with it. And I was like, what? Like, and we, we give a fair valuation. And so we give what we think is like something acceptable and something we'll take and, and we lead with like the right thing. And so that was just like the most beautiful phone call I've ever had. And it was like, oh, I want all founders to be like this. And of course, no founder has ever been like that again. Um, but it was this moment where it was like, you know, I see the value in working with you. And so like, if everything goes well, every, it, nothing matters, this is gonna be great. And so I really like that perspective. Um, and I, I found that really refreshing in the moment. Um, one nit that I think comes up time and time again for me is, and I have deep empathy for founders, I could not do the job that, that you guys do. And I'm just so thankful I have the opportunity to invest in you and support you. Um, in, but, but one thing that comes up time and time again is a fundraise is brutal. Like, it is literally like probably the, 
one of the top 10 worst experiences in your life is like fundraising for your company. You're not sleeping, you're not eating well, you're telling the same story over and over again, you're talking to some people that get it, some people that don't, it's a lot of no's, it takes a lot of persistence and a lot of grit. And so I really, I understand when a company that we give a term sheet to says, oh, you know, I just really want this like fundraise to be over. And I'm like, I do too. I really want your fundraise to be over. But then they come at me with like a list of 10 or 15 things to negotiate that we've already addressed. And the reason the fundraise isn't over is because they won't let it be over. Um, and that, that's something where um, I think I see first time founders do it, again, do it a lot. Really experienced founders really take this perspective where they're like, you know what? It's better to just be done than perfect. And I think that can save you a lot of time and energy because um, when you get the money in your, in your bank account, um, you don't really get to rest. You're going to get a phone call from me being like, okay, when are we doing our first strategy kickoff? You know, and so it's, it's better to, be, to minimize that process. Um, that's one nit that I always kind of, I kind of get a kick out of because um, I desperately want the process of the phone calls and the emails to be over too. All right, well, glad we, you got an opportunity to vent. Um, so hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, you, you queued me up for that. You're like, all right, talk about something yeah. negative. You were, you were set up for that. Um, so yeah, I do want to hop into questions shortly. Um, we just have one more for you before we, uh, we do that. Um, just knowing what you know now, what would you change um, just in regards to your, your past, in regards to this whole experience? As an entrepreneur, fundraising, I think it would definitely be to get a support network. As she said, it's such a grind fundraising and just do learn as much as you can, but know you can't learn everything and know there's gonna be a lot of rejection involved, there's gonna be success, um, but it's just a journey and it's really great to have a support network of other entrepreneurs or a community that you can vent to and that can you know support you through the process. Awesome, thank you for that. The, the one thing I'd add also would be, you know, as you're thinking about this, you know, term sheet negotiation or just fundraising in general, you know, this is also an opportunity for you to ask questions of the investor. Like, you know, what is your value proposition? What is your value add? Like, what do you bring to the table? Not every investor is the same, and they want to be perceived as being different and unique and value add. So this is an opportunity for you to get to know them as well as, as a team, as individuals, et cetera. And then asking, you know, well, who have you worked with in the past? And maybe, you know, to your point on, on support network, you know, talking to some of those other founders that they've invested in before so that you get a sense for, you know, what's the spirit of kind of working with these people? Because that may inform how you negotiate with them, right? Like if, if you know that ultimately they're reasonable people, they've worked with a number of founders, everyone's happy, then you don't want to be perceived as the problem child kind of going into it and being really hardcore. Um, you know, if you know, there are investors that don't always play nice in the sandbox, then you, you want to be you know, getting the right counsel, talking to the right people to make sure that you, you know how to approach it from, you know, what if things don't go as, as we all expect it to go. So I think that's a, that's a fabulous point. One thing that we do at Layer Hippo is, um, you know, we really believe that the value of a, an investor really comes out when things go sideways. So instead of introducing our founders to the founders of Casper and Warby Parker and all of our great companies, we'll actually introduce them to the companies that didn't succeed and didn't go well, because that's really the color of an investor. And so you can do that type of diligence in a term sheet, uh, like in the term sheet phase, when someone says, hey, they want to invest and they want to commit, you should say, great, I'd love to have you as a partner. Can you send me a reference list or a diligence list? What have been the companies that have done well and what are the companies that have not done so well? And make sure you, you talk to those people um, the founders that have struggled, because I think that's critical. Great, thank you for that. Um, so just so we can all have some real tangible takeaways, what are some tools or sites that founders should explore to dig more into these topics? I know SVB Bank, they put on a lot of programming for founders, and so you might want to take advantage. There are several banks that have programs. Um, and angels, a lot of angel groups will put on programs as well that's more educational, and so those are always really great to go to. Um, so as part of my training in one of, one of my venture jobs, I had to sit down and I had to read all of the NVCA docs, 
And like these are, and I put them in a binder, and this is like a lot of paper, and it was like really aggressive, and it was really boring, and I don't even know that I finished all of them, but it's, a, it's an exercise that I think is really important. You should sit down, you should read a term sheet, you should write down what you think it means. What's the investor-friendly version? What's the founder-friendly version? What does this actually say? Because I think most people don't even just sit down and read it. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit in like legalese, but you can also ask questions. But I think just doing the work and reading a charter or reading a term sheet, you'll learn a lot just in that process. And it's going to answer questions for you um, just this year act of doing that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll note two things. So the NVCA forms are actually footnoted. And so they're, they often will say, this provision is more investor favorable, or there's a variant that's more investor favorable, and here's why. This one is more um, founder favorable, and here's why. So, so I think those are a really valuable tool. Uh, the other one I'll plug is, because we run it, is, is Founders Workbench. So it, it's a site that we've, uh, at Goodwin, developed really as a, as a resource tool for founders. Um, so you, not only does it have kind of current blog posts, kind of state of market, um, information about any of these terms, but it also has a document driver, so you can actually go and you can create your company, you can run your cap table, you can see what you know a founder's uh, a purchase agreement will be, what vesting terms are, and then you can get the same documents that we use, and, and if you were a client that we'd give to you, um, so that's another great resource for you guys. I, uh, foundersworkbench.com. If you like books, there are a couple books that I think are pretty interesting. Um, there's a book called Mastering the VC Game by uh, an investor named Jeffrey Buskang. It's like a little bit founder story, a little bit technical. I think it's amazing. And it's for founders to master the venture capital game, not investors to master the venture capital game. Uh, and then I really like a book by um, an investor named Brad Feld called Venture Deals. This is effectively like a Bible for any kind of junior investor. If you want to get technical and we want to really understand the dynamics, I think it's a, it's a great resource. Um, but for founders, when you've got a million things to do, there are like Cliff Notes versions online, but those are two really great sources for more of the story element. And there's also some accelerator programs that also offer free programming. They have breakfast, lunch, and they'll um, invite the community and then talk about kind of like we are today, um, different things that you need to know as an entrepreneur, term sheets, um, building your team, creating your pitch deck, and they'll be more focused. So Entrepreneur's Acceler Entrepreneur Roundtable Accelerator is one of the accelerators that I mentor at, and, and they are very good, and they are open to the public. Great, thank you for that. And uh, we have some great questions as well uh, that came in. I have a tablet here that's not quite working, so I'm just gonna kind of peek over here and see what you got going on. Uh, first question for the panel is, what are some common benchmarks investors ask startups to reach? Great question. I guess that's for me. <laughs> um, it totally depends. So it depends on what stage you're at and what type of business you are. So for example, if you're a software business, it's gonna be monthly recurring revenue. If you're a consumer business, it's going to be um, some sense of sales. So it totally depends. So I'll just bring it down to the seed level because I think that's probably where we are. Um, in terms of benchmarks, so benchmarks for invest that investors need. Um, I think on, you know, to make an investment decision, the team's got to be fabulous and, and stellar and be sparkly and be stars. And those are all kind of weird descriptions because you can't really Describe it until you see it. So there's got to be grit. There's got to be persistence. When I talk to your former bosses or your former employees, they say this person is amazing. I would totally back this person. I think that's one kind of like sanity check benchmark around the person. And then I look at the founder and I think, is this someone who can really recruit amazing people to come join them and, uh, and get them along on their mission? So that's kind of one. If you have a product or a demo, um, it's always good to see that. It's really, it's much easier to build, to raise money off of something that's tangible and physical, physical and something I can play with than an idea. Um, I think a financial model is always really um, important, even if you're just raising off an idea, some sort of semblance of um, how many users you're gonna get, what that's gonna cost you, really understanding the mechanics of your business and the strategy you'd need to push your business. Um, I think particularly investors in New York, we're much more analytical and kind of unit economic driven than I would say maybe the West Coast if I were to compare the two. And so really knowing your business better than we know your business and, and being thoughtful and having answers to questions, those are kind of like the baseline benchmarks. Um, once you raise for a Series A, it becomes around how much you're raising, is your business profitable, what does the path to profitability look like, all those types of, um, of uh, other types of metrics, but it totally depends. 
Great. Um, another question. So for a profitable business, what kind of formula do you typically perform to get that valuation? For a profitable business, what type of math do you do to get your valuation? Correct. So a business that's already uh, that's already operating and having revenue coming in, how are you? What formula are you put, are you using to come up with a valuation? Yeah, I mean, one way that an investor is going to think through valuation, and, and therefore you should think through, is you know they're going to be underwriting to a certain level of return, right? They're going to have an expectation of whether there's a multiple of invested capital or whether there's going to be an IRR. So they're going to think about if I invest money today, and if I believe in the plan and we're going to exit in five years, we want to target X return, right? So they're going to be thinking through that, and that's how they're going to think through you know, arriving at what they think the art of the possible is. Clearly, there are going to be multiple scenarios in terms of what's an upside case, what's a base case, what's a downside case. You know, that's one way. Um, as we talked about before, there are other ways in terms of comparables, et cetera, um, that people would arrive at, at ascribing valuation. I would say that if you have a profitable business, um, venture capital <laughs> might not be the funding source for you. You've already kind of leapfrogged past something really important. So something to keep in mind, it's not for everybody. I don't often work with profitable businesses, so. <laughs> well, and, and then just, just one, one thing on profitability. Like so many companies today that are not profitable could be profitable if they wanted to. So there was a mention about unit economics, right? So, in the earlier stage, there's some founders who are so, you know, in their mind, they think I got to be profitable, right? When instead, what they should be doing is actually investing and growing the company faster, right? So profitability is not the end game, is how do you actually gain the scale and get the, the beachfront, you know, massive, go after the massive opportunity that's ahead of you, as opposed to focusing, you know, in, I need to be profitable today. People know that you could be profitable, if you didn't invest as much in marketing, if you didn't do the things that you were doing to invest in the business, the question is, are the unit economics, do they work, right? Like, that's what investors are gonna be focused on initially. And um, another great question came up, and I think this can calm some nerves, is roughly how much time surpasses between the pitch and receiving a term sheet? What does that look like? I think it, it depends. Um, some comp so it's very different for everyone. I hear founders complaining about certain groups that take longer than others. Um, at Pipeline, we have uh, like a four-week uh, term, so you know you're going to hear a yes or a no, and we're going to get the ball rolling within four weeks. But I think it can vary. I think from for like Lair Hippo, where it's a pretty I think quick to decision process. It's usually from the first meeting to a decision I would say is probably three weeks. And your real limiting factor there is the number of partner meetings you can get in um, from, from when you've had your first company, your first pitch to, to the very end. So typically a partner meeting is when the whole team gets together and they talk about your business. And so you typically need a couple rounds because I can, I can pitch a business and say, I just saw the best business in the world, we should invest. And then someone will say, well, that's great. These are all the questions of why it might not be the best business in the world. And so I have to go, disappear for a week and get those answers and have someone else from the team meet them uh, and then we come back and we all talk about it and everyone agrees with me that it's the best business in the world and then we put down a term sheet <laughs> or people don't agree with me and then we don't put down a term sheet um, so that's like at the small end but typically it'll take a couple when you're raising it should take you probably three months from when you first start your process to when you get your first term sheet you're going to have a lot of false starts. You're going to have a lot of conversations. You're going to have a lot of people on teams traveling. A lot of people go to San Francisco or LA or go on vacation. Life happens. And so you have to kind of account for that. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say three months would be a success, right? From the moment you say, I'm ready, I'm going to get prepared, and then I'm going to go. You know, you're going to need you know, time to prepare. And that's going to take you a month to just kind of get all the documents in place, fi you know, finalize your presentation, finalize your model, kind of be ready for prime time. And then once you have that first initial meeting with the investor, they're not just going to go away and then like be in a vacuum you know, for three or four weeks and then come back to you with a term sheet. So that time, that period of time, is, is going to be a function of the information flow, the speed at which you can you know, respond to the questions that they have, the level of preparation that you've done prior to that so that they can actually go and inform their, their team, teammates in terms of what questions do we have at the outset, Here's the, the answers that we have, what additional questions came out of those initial requests. So that's gonna be, I'd say probably, I think a month you know, between your initial meeting 
and, uh, and receiving a term sheet plus or minus a couple of weeks. And you can expedite this by having a very thorough diligence room set up. So a Dropbox folder with a bunch of uh, with a bunch of different folders in them: your financials, your business plan, your marketing plan. If you have all of that, it will make it so much easier for the investor. So we don't have to go back to you so many times with data requests. So so much easier because when you have a block of a couple hours that you can process a company, it's beautiful, and you can prep that for you can create an investment memo just by looking at that. When you don't, it gets really stalled, and then if there are a couple companies happening at one time, it gets incredibly difficult to have. Um, usually the junior person is packaging your deal, um, so if you can make things easy for them and accessible for them, it makes things easier, and that is, that's such a great tip, and thank you so much for saying that. It seems like there's almost like a seasonality, right? I mean, if it's like summertime, everyone's traveling, it can take longer to get a response, um, and then maybe end of the year, people are trying to get these things off the books quicker, so you, know, you can even have a strategy around that. Um, I, I, I don't know. I haven't, I don't think the cycles are real. And I, <laughs> I think that the partners, like partners and maybe disappear for a couple weeks in the summer, but uh, it's not a bad idea to be raising in the summer because everyone's under this impression that like everyone takes the summer off, but, and so no one, everyone's holding their companies until September and September, October, November are the worst months of my life. And like we have nothing to do for the most part in that, in that kind of, uh, July, August lull. So if you can get something in before the first couple weeks of August, I think it's amazing. We've done deals in August. We do deals all the time in August. Um, and also even, even the holidays. If you can spend a little time in December and kind of get people thinking, you can kind of come back on, on a further footing in January. Um, so I, I, I say, you know, if you've got a good company, company and you need money, like don't spend too much time thinking about the venture cycles. I think a lot of it is, is, uh, isn't reality. Um, and there's no better time to get someone to pay attention to you when there's not a lot going on. Awesome, great point. You're the expert here, so I appreciate that. Um, so we have just a few more minutes. Let me uh, grab another one here. Uh, do bad terms initially only result in bad fundraising rounds later, or is it possible um, to get uh, a meaningful renegotiation later? So uh, you know, we advise a lot of companies on on kind of later stage rounds, and you know, oftentimes you know we see kind of best practices where you know you set the right terms on the initial round, and then everything kind of follows because most investors on subsequent rounds are going to say, well, what did you agree to on the last round, and that's you know sets the benchmark. But we, we've seen you know really messy um, cap tables and different securities and different preferences, et cetera, and we've seen very clean ones. So yes, you can negotiate stuff later, but you always want to start, you know, kind of with, with the best deal that you can. And I think the earlier point that was made is, you know, don't think that you need to solve it all day one in terms of all the capital that you're going to need. Just do it in sequence, right? Always be kind of on the front foot by achieving the milestones that you said you were going to achieve, and then kind of continue to build the company that you set out to do, so that when you're fundraising, you're not really at the behest of the, of the investor. Great, thank you. I was definitely paying attention. Uh, so <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me grab one more. Uh, I do appreciate it. Let me grab one more. Um, and then I assume we're going to be here um, a little bit afterwards. So additional questions, you know, feel free to reach out. Uh, but I'll grab one more here. Uh, do investors at the seed stage um, stay through series A and B? Uh, with a dilution, do they downgrade their involvement in the startup? Yeah, I think typically they, they do. Um, so seed investors are really great for that seed to Series A phase. Um, on occasion, they might stay on the board for, after you raise a Series A, but typically beyond a Series A, they eventually roll off. Um, the board will get too big. Um, the amount that you can help is maybe not as much or not as meaningful. And so um, there is a point when you generally roll off the board um, if you take a board seat at all. Um, one thing that we do require is we, in, in all of our deals, we require information rights. So even if we're no longer on the board, we're getting the board updates, we're getting quarterly reporting, we're seeing what's happening with our investment. So that's a way to kind of stay in touch. Um, occasionally, um, we have kind of some of our investors stay on the board long term. So Ben Lair is actually on the board of Casper, which has raised a number of different rounds. Um, but I would say that's more kind of by exception um, than anything else. Yeah, we see that with companies all the time. I think, again, it goes back to the relationship and, and what's that value add for, for what stage of investor, right? So 
early stage, they will help you get through your C to your A, to A to B, potentially they stay on longer, but often they're also encouraging you and they have a network of later stage investors that they may, they may like, they may partner with to come in in those later rounds to help you go from you know, your, initial, uh, your initial startup phase, your initial revenue to how do you grow? How do you, how do you grow outside the US? And some funds are, are more helpful in, in those type of activities. And then you'll also see strategics come on board. So these are investors that, that are not funds and, and purely financially, but they may, they may work in that industry. So if it's a healthcare company, you could think of you know, an insurance company that might invest. If it's, if it's a prop tech company, it might be a large property owner that invests. And so they can bring on more than just capital, but they could be a customer, they could be operational resources, they could be market intelligence. So again, I, I think that board dynamic changes and, and that type of investor changes through the round. And, and for also just a bit more context, as a seed investor, you're okay with that. So if a, if a, if a later stage investor is series B, series you know, B, C, D strategic, their incentives are the same as ours. They're gonna have preferred stock, they're gonna have equity. They've created a price that now they need to surpass. And so generally we're, we're all rowing in the same direction and we're okay with that. So it's not a bad thing to roll off of a board but in any way. Great. Any other closing thoughts? No, I think, I think they, they covered it. I think in terms of, of the board uh, representation, I do think that part of it is making sure that the board represents you know, various skill sets. So you don't want to have just all people who are finance driven, right? You want people who are bringing perspectives that really address the needs of the company as they think about scaling, right? So who has expertise in marketing, for example, who has expertise with you know, certain connections in different geographies. So not, you know, not having a board that's full of investors is not necessarily the best thing for the company. Uh, just on the board point, I think we also, it, there's an operational element here, right? There's just a scheduling element. So, so we also think about the board as, the board is responsible for the entire management. So, you, so we also create advisory boards where you, where you have those experts to come in to lend their expertise, but don't necessarily have to sit through we're now going to give you know, our rank and file engineers these option grants. Are these the right number of grants? Right? There's an operational element, and different board members can add to that operational element. And then you can have an advisory board that, that can help you with bigger picture, more strategic initiatives as well. Great. Well, well, thank you again for that. I mean, this has been amazing, and uh, I'm sure we all appreciate your willingness to share your, your knowledge and your experiences with us. And you know, for a lot of you, you know, the first time you have these conversations with someone like these individuals might be kind of nerve-wracking, right? But I think they've done a great job of just letting them know what to expect, um, and then beyond that, you know, what to how to best prepare for these conversations. Um, so again, thank you very much. I do appreciate your time, and thank you for coming out. Thank you.